Hey, what is going on all you bus nuts, geeks, and enthusiasts out there? Welcome back to another episode of Motor Coach World. My name is James. Traveling long distance by bus during the 1950s was viewed upon much differently than it is today. First of all, it was a much more popular method of transportation. More people used it. It was even considered glamorous to take your family, hop on a Greyhound, and go tour the good old US of A for the weekend. Not quite like that anymore today. Anyway, back then there were two big players in the motor coach industry that provided the public with cross-country services. There was Greyhound and its main rival, Continental Trailways. In 1954, Greyhound introduced the revolutionary 40-foot-long two-level coach into its fleet, the General Motors PD4501 Scenic Cruiser. Its design made it modern and futuristic looking as well as being larger than any other motor coach model of its time, which really caught the public's eye. On top of the public, it also caught the eye of Greyhound's biggest competitor, Continental Trailways. Maurice E. Moore, who was the CEO of Continental Trailways at the time, realized that in order to stay competitive, Continental Trailways needed its own iconic bus for its fleet. And so, Maurice set out to find a designer for Continental's new dream bus. Let's see what's out there. Which would end up being one of the most iconic and cherished buses the motor coach industry would ever see in the US, the Eagle. Continental Trailways immediately turned to one of General Motors' competitors, a well-known bus manufacturer at the time called Flexible, which was headquartered in Loudonville, Ohio. Now, Flexible agreed to design and produce Trailway's future dream fleet under one condition. Flexible wanted payment for all design work and tooling costs for the project up front. Now, this turned out to be kind of a problem for Continental Trailways because, you see, they were kind of strapped for cash. Between 1948 and 1953, Continental Trailways purchased the Santa Fe Trail Company and transcontinental carrier American Bus Lines. They were two large bus companies during that time, and by doing so, Continental had drained their cash reserves. So the deal fell through between Continental Trailways and Flexible, and Continental continued its search. So Maurice E. Moore, who was again Continental CEO at the time, turned to Europe for a possible option, and before long, he found success. In the 1950s, there was a huge demand for commercial vehicles in Europe but buses only accounted for about 10% of the overall demand. The demand was mainly for trucks. So when it came to European bus manufacturing needing chassis to build buses on, passenger carrying buses were forced to be built on chassis that were actually designed for trucks. The problem with that was truck chassis created a rougher ride and was bendable and flexible. Now that's good for trucks that needed to bend and twist under heavy loads. But this was actually horrible for buses when you have a giant box built on top of the chassis. This caused windows to crack or pop out and the bus body to bend and twist over time, causing cracks. Bus manufacturers in Europe simply didn't have much control over the design or delivery of these chassis since they only made up 10% of the demand. Well, a German bus manufacturer called Kasboher changed all of that when they designed a revolutionary new chassisless body just for buses. It was a self-supporting body frame that allowed for independent front suspension with a rear engine drive. Now this breakthrough in bus design by Kasboher really put them in the spotlight for the future of bus design in Europe. Kasboher proudly named their new line of buses that used this new frame technology Silbstragen, which translated to English meant self-carrying. The name was later shortened to Setra, which basically included the first few letters of each of the two words in Selbstragen. Well, all this caught the eye of Continental Trailways in the US, who was still looking for a producer to design and build their future dream bus to compete with Greyhound. And if my grandmother had wheels, she'd be a wagon. It wasn't long before Continental Trailway CEO Maurice Moore struck a deal with Kasboher and work began on the design of Continental Trailways' future fleet. By 1956, the first prototype bus built in cooperation between Continental Trailways in the US and Kasboher bus manufacturer in Germany rolled off the assembly lines and shipped to Houston, Texas for testing. The coach was named the Golden Eagle by Continental Trailways. She was 40 feet long, 96 inches wide, and stood at a height of 11 feet, one inch, with three axles, and powered with a MAN D1566 engine with a ZF Media Preselector six-speed transmission. 
On the interior, the Golden Eagle offered a very luxurious cabin layout, including an aircraft style galley with a rear lounge that featured two tables with pairs of facing seats next to large observation windows. During its year long test run on routes, Continental offered additional luxuries, including an onboard hostess that served snacks and drinks in route. Pillows and blankets were also offered along with newspapers and magazines on request. If any of you have pictures or video footage of this bus that you want to share, please post them on Motor Coach World's Facebook page for everyone to see. Oh, and a huge shout out to Chris from Bus TV Chad for letting me use his awesome footage of the Eagle. Chris has a really cool YouTube channel with tons of awesome bus footage. So all of you go check out Bus TV Chad. Link to his channel will be down in the description box below. Anyway, in 1957, after about a year in service, Continental was ready for mass production. A contract for 126 highway coaches was placed, with work starting on the first batch of 55 units. Overall, Continental was very happy with how the first Eagle prototype performed during its first year of trial service. The most noticeable change of the first 55 coaches compared to the original prototype was a different arrangement of the six-piece windshield at the front of the coach. During the prototype Eagle's first year in service, driver complained about getting baked in the sun during long trips due to the angled bubble windows above the driver's seat. Even the onboard air conditioning system didn't help the driver under the hot Texas sun with the way the windows were positioned over the driver. Heat shields at maximum. So instead of the bubble windshield panels wrapping upwards around the roof, they were redesigned to be more vertical and forward facing. In addition to these modifications on the first order of coaches, Continental also placed an order of four 60 feet long articulated versions of the Golden Eagle powered by a more robust Rolls-Royce diesel engine in which they dubbed the Super Golden Eagle. 1958, Continental Trailways had some time to experience their new fleet in action. By the end of the year, Continental placed an additional order for 41 coaches. These coaches were once again slightly different from their predecessors. Continental dubbed these new coaches Silver Eagles instead of the original Golden Eagles. Other than the fact that the Silver Eagles had silver aluminum panels on the outside instead of the golden ones, the exterior wasn't all that different from their predecessor. On the interior, however, the Silver Eagles got rid of many of the luxuries that the Golden Eagles offered. The aircraft style galley as well as tables were removed and replaced with all forward facing seats, similar to that of a conventional coach today. The less luxurious layout of the Silver Eagles became the new standard coach of Continental Trailways. By 1959, Kosboher was facing a huge demand of buses on their home front in Europe. At this point, Kosboher and Continental had already started designing changes for the next series of 85 Silver Eagle buses to be built in 1960. Left with a tough decision to make, Kosboher informed Continental Trailways of their intentions to stop production of the Eagle buses so that they could focus more on their local demand for buses in Europe. Now, Kosboher had agreed to sell all of the plans, tooling equipment, and existing spare parts of the Eagle to Continental. Kosboher also agreed to manufacture certain assemblies and parts for the 85 units of Silver Eagles they had previously agreed to build for Continental. But Kosboher made it clear that after that, if Continental wanted to continue to build Eagles in Europe, they would have to find another partner. And so they did. By 1960, Continental Trailways had partnered with a company called Le Bruheva et le Nefeles. Le Bruheva le Nefeles. Le Bruheva Le Nefeles, a Belgian company that primarily built railway equipment. I spent like 30 minutes practicing the name of this company, so I'm sorry if I butchered it. Le Bruheva actually helped Continental establish its own factory in Belgium to build Eagle buses in the future without any disruption. The factory was named Bus and Car Incorporated. So much easier to pronounce. This new partnership between Continental and Le Bruheva was a solid one, and by 1961, Le Bruheva successfully delivered the 85 new Silver Eagle buses that were promised to Continental previously. For the next 30 years, the Eagle Coach became a common name in the coach industry. Over 8,000 Eagle Coaches were built in four countries on two different continents. Eagle Coaches were quite a common sight on US interstates and highways, with most of them operating under continental liveries. Now, between 1961 and 1990, over 30 different models and variants of the Eagle buses were produced. 
Now, as much as I'd like to spend the next two hours describing and going into the details of each of the models and variants and how this coach evolved over time, in the interest of keeping this video under 20 minutes, I'm going to touch on some of the more significant ways the Eagle coach has evolved over the years. But for those of you who want all the details and technical data of all the variants of this coach, the links to the sources I used in my research for this video are down in the description box below. Feel free to check them out. By 1961, Continental's new factory in Belgium, Boston Car Incorporated, began producing Eagles for the first time. The first models released under this new partnership was known as the Eagle Model 1. The noticeable change in body style compared to the older model Eagles was a new wraparound mesh grille, which remained a feature until 1969. In 1963, the Model 1 Eagles were produced with a taller roof, but it only lasted for that year. 1964, the Model 1 Eagle added air operating parking brakes and new air intakes for the engine. Another small cosmetic change was that in 1965, the Eagle's trim and red lightning bolt was raised to the window level. The Model 1 was produced until mid-1968. In 1967, a prototype 40-foot-long two-axle variant of the Eagle was created, known as the Model 2. It also had a 102-inch wide body, as all Eagles were 96 inches wide up to this point. However, it was the only one of its kind to be produced, and the body width reverted back to 96 inches wide on the next model. Between 1966 and 1971, the Model 4 was produced for European and North African customers with just over 100 units produced. In 1968, Eagle introduced the new Model 5. It continued to use the Model 1's body, but there were a number of changes internally. One of the most noticeable changes of the Model 5 was that the tag axle was moved in front of the drive axle, or otherwise known as a bogey or pusher axle. Another significant change was replacing the four smaller luggage bay doors with three larger ones. 1969, the Model 5 received a more square look with a squared off front end as opposed to the rounder body style of the original Model 1. Now, three of the Model 5 Silver Eagle coaches were actually built with Ford gas turbine engines offering 450 horsepower and 600 horsepower during 1969. The gas turbine engine experiment, however, ended about a year later due to high fuel consumption as the Ford gas turbine engines only gave the coach about four miles per gallon. They also had severe reliability issues. The three Eagle coaches in this experiment were eventually repowered with the standard Detroit Diesel 8V71 engines. From this point on, many operators referred to the Model 5 squared body style as the New Look or Square Eagles, and any of the Eagles with the rounded body style was referred to as the Old Look or round eagles. The Model 5 Eagles became the iconic look for Continental Trailways and were typically associated with the company. Now, many of the Eagle Model 5s also found second lives after their service life ended with Continental as they were very popular with motorhome conversions and entertainment shell industries. In 1970, Eagle produced the Model 7. They were practically identical to the Model 5, except they were 102 inches wide. Now, the Eagle Model 7 was actually the first 102 inch wide coach to be mass produced in the Eagle line, unlike that of the 102 inch wide prototype Model 2 with only one built. The Eagle Model 7s were exclusively built for Continental Trailways and were never sold to other carriers. Only 45 of these were ever produced, and again, subsequent models of the Eagles reverted back to the 96 inch wide bodies. In 1972, the Eagle Model 9s were produced for South African Railways. They retained the Model 5's body, except they were only 35 feet long, but yet they kept the three axles. Other exports of the Model 9 were adapted to several other countries like Australia, Canada, Thailand, and many other European countries. By 1977, due to the rising labor costs in Belgium, the decision was made to shift all Eagle production to the US. For the next three years, the new Eagle International Factory in Brownsville, Texas was the only factory to produce Eagle coaches after 1977. In 1980, the Model 10 came off the factory line with 2,217 coaches produced. The Model 10 was produced all the way up to 1987, a very successful model of the Eagle. In 1982, Eagle opened a second Eagle factory in Harlingen, Texas and produced a special two-axle variant of the Model 10 called the Model 10 Suburban, or Model 10 S. The Model 10 S Eagle received little success with only 84 of them built due to severe limitations on its axle load. In 1985, the Eagle Model 15 was introduced with, yet again, a 102-inch wide body, as well as a more aerodynamic front end with a more gently tapered roofline at the front. 
The Model 15 was also offered in 35, 40, and for the first time, 45 foot length. The Model 15 Eagles was also offered with larger front windows for a better view for the driver, as well as the passengers. This model was later updated in 1987, calling it the Model 20. However, the Eagle once again reverted back to its 96 inch wide body. Make up your minds, will ya? In 1987, Greyhound Lines moved in and purchased Continental Trailways as well as Eagle. For the first time, Eagle coaches were seen on the roads wearing Greyhound's colors. This new arrangement, however, was short-lived as three years later, in June of 1990, Greyhound declared bankruptcy. And despite the fact that Eagle successfully sold 341 Model 15 coaches in 1989 and 1990, Eagle stopped all production of Eagle coaches by the end of December of 1990 due to poor management as well as a long-lasting driver's strike. Now, after all of this, several companies tried to revive the Eagle's brand and image, including an attempt to build Eagles for the Mexican market. But it was short-lived and fizzled off with very few Mexican Eagles produced. In the mid-2000s, another attempt was made yet again to try to revive the Eagle coach brand. A company called Silver Eagle Bus Manufacturing Incorporated was established in Brownsville, Texas. Using tooling equipment and parts left over from the failed Mexico market, Silver Eagle Bus Manufacturing Incorporated offered the older Model 15 and Model 20 in 37, 40, and 45 foot versions. In addition, they designed a new 102 inch wide Model 25 available in 40 and 45 foot versions. The Model 25 abandoned most of the traditional Eagle body styles in an attempt to maximize interior volume to be more appealing to the motorhome market. However, only one 45-foot version of the Model 25 was ever built and sold. On top of that, the Model 25 was never tested or certified as a passenger carrying coach with the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Administration. After only a short time with very few units produced, Silver Eagle Bus Manufacturing Incorporated went out of business. The company from the start was undercapitalized and was unable to pay off many of its creditors. On a fun side note, the Eagle used to make up the backbone of Puria Charter's fleet. In fact, it was such a cherished bus for us that we even painted it on one of our murals in our meeting room. On top of that, we took the front end off of one of the Eagles that we scrapped back in the day and mounted it to the entrance of our waiting room building. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, please hit that like and subscribe button. Be sure to check out Motor Coach World's Facebook page. All the links to these pages will be down in the description box below. And again, if you want to see all the sources I used, I'll also put all the links down in the description box as well. And folks, if you're watching this, then you are part of the Motor Coach World.